Ladies and gents, I'm Bruce Jiri Excel, and this is what happens if we throw an elephant from a skyscraper. Life in size one. Oh, he made more than one videos of life in size. He made a series out of it. It's gonna be fun. Size is the most underappreciated regulators of living things. Let us demonstrate that by throwing animals from buildings. Yeah, okay. I hope he he just means it by a thought experiment, not an actual practical experiment. Yeah. This is where the channel goes goes in a nutshell. This is a great, great channel. I love reacting to these videos from this channel. I react to one video from this channel every day. You know, I reacted quite a few videos from this channel already. Check out the cars. There's a playlist I created for it. Cause Gazard reacts and something like that. Check out the playlist too, like Real Life Lore, CGP Grey, yeah, all the sarcastic production, internet story and things like that. And yeah, let's watch this one. Let's start this video by throwing a mouse, a dog, and an elephant from a skyscraper onto something soft. Let's say, a stack of mattresses. The mouse lands and is stunned for a moment before it shakes itself off and walks away pretty annoyed because that's a very rude thing to do. Yeah. The dog breaks all of its bones and dies in an unspectacular way, and the elephant explodes into a red puddle of bones and insides and has no chance to be annoyed. Why does the mouse survive, but the elephant and dog don't? Yeah, I mean, obviously, when you hear that thing, like, you know, if you throw two, uh, you know, objects, they will fall at the same speed, not faster or slower. So you think, like, why does the mouse survive and not the elephant? First of all, if you throw two things, yes, they will fall at the same uh, speed, but that is not taking air into account. If there is air, there's going to be air resistance. So basically, I think mouse, uh, since it, mouse is lighter, would get affected by air resistance more. So I guess mouse would be a bit slower going down than the elephant, since, you know, air resistance affects mouse a lot, I guess. So, you know, th that's why maybe mouse survives and elephant does not. That could be one of those things. Obviously, dog broke all its bones. Yeah. This is a weird thing, because cause I just woke up one, one day and just thought, hmm, what should I make a video about? You know what, let's throw, uh, throw animals off the buildings and see the science behind that, yeah. The answer is size. Yeah. Size is the most underappreciated regulator of living things. Size determines everything about our biology, how we're built, how we experience the world, how we live and die. It does so because the physical laws are different for different sized animals. Life spans seven orders of magnitude, from invisible bacteria to mites, ants, mice, dogs, humans, elephants, and blue whales. Every size lives in its own unique universe right next to each other, each with its own rules, upsides, and downsides. We'll explore these different worlds in a series of videos. Let's get back to the initial question. Why did our mouse survive the fall? Because of how scaling size changes everything, a principle that we'll meet over and over again. Very small things, for example, are practically immune to falling from great heights because the smaller you are, the less you care about the effect of gravity. Imagine a theoretical spherical animal the size of a marble. It has three features, its length, its surface area, which is covered in skin, and its volume, or all the stuff inside it like organs, muscles, hopes and dreams. Uh, if we make it 10 times longer, say the size of a basketball... Ah, uh, I, I see where he's going. When you scale something, the volume goes, you know, uh, really higher than the scale, I guess. If you if you double a small ball just by, you know, the total size, the volume of it will go immensely high, like 10, 100 times, something like that. I don't know the math behind it. You know, when I was a kid, I remember thinking about that, like, you know, I don't know, was it about uh, filling water into a balloon or something like that? I don't remember exactly, but something like that. That just, you know, when I put twice as the water in the balloon and then, you know, I realized that balloon just as a size didn't double. And then I started to think about, obviously at the time I didn't, I wasn't at the, you know, in the school at the standard where, you know, they explain all this about volume and volumosphere and things. So basically if you double the ball, the volume inside would be even higher than that, not just double. So I think that's what he's talking about. I mean, you know, proportion to your, you know, volume of your mass, your size is bigger than the counterpart since you are really small, I guess. So elephant has way more mass uh, for its size, I guess, compared to the small insects. So, you know, because the volume goes immensely high. 
The rest of its features don't just grow 10 times. Yeah. Its skin will grow 100 times, and its insides, or its yeah. volume, grows by one. Yeah, so if you increase the ball, I guess, like he's saying, if you increase the ball 10 times as the, its original size, the volume will go higher by 1,000 times more. Yeah. 1,000 times. The volume determines the weight, or more accurately, mass of the animal. Yeah. The more mass you have, the higher your kinetic energy before you hit the ground, and the stronger the impact shock. Yeah, e equals mz squared, basically. Mass equals energy, so the more mass you have, the more kinetic energy you have when you, ex when you, you, know, when you hit, I guess. The more surface area in relation to your volume or mass you have, the more the impact gets distributed and softened, and also the more air resistance will slow you down. Yeah. An elephant is so big that it has extremely little surface area in ratio to its volume, so yeah. a lot of kinetic energy gets distributed over a small space and the air doesn't slow it down much at all. That's why it's completely destroyed in an impressive explosion of goo when it hits the ground. The other extreme, insects, have a huge surface area in relation to their tiny mass, so you can literally throw an ant from an aeroplane and it will not be seriously harmed. But while falling is irrelevant in the small world, there are other forces that are harmless for us, but extreme. Yeah, and also, like, the air resistance would be much higher for the ant, I guess. Ant would barely feel falling. Extremely dangerous for small beings. Like surface tension, which turns water into a potentially deadly substance for insects. Oh, yeah, that is How true. Does it work? I don't know, was it Star Talk? Or I don't know which podcast was that. Well, somebody was explaining that. Like... Gravity and falling doesn't hurt an insect much because insects don't feel gravity that much. That's why, you know, insects can walk up to a wall, I guess, because they don't feel gravity much. But they do feel immense level of surface tension. If uh, there's a, you know, water bubble somewhere there, water droplet, basically insects could get trapped inside there because water droplet doesn't let go of the ant because the surface tension is immensely high. Water has the tendency to stick to itself. Yeah. Its molecules are attracted to each other through a force called cohesion, which creates a tension on its surface that you can imagine as a sort of invisible skin. For us, this skin is so weak that we don't even notice it normally. If you get wet, about 800 grams of water, or about 1% of your body weight, sticks to you. A wet mouse has about 3 grams of water sticking to it, which is more than 10% of its body weight. Imagine having 8 full water bottles sticking to you when you leave the shower. But for an insect, the force of water's surface tension is so strong that getting wet is a question of life and death. If we were to shrink you to the size of an ant and you touch water, it would be like you were reaching into glue. It would quickly engulf you, its surface tension too hard for you to break, and you'd drown. So insects evolved to be water repellent. For one, their exoskeleton is covered with a thin layer of wax, just like a car. This makes their surface at least partly water repellent because it can't stick to it very well. Many insects are also covered with tiny hairs that serve as a barrier. They vastly increase their surface area and prevent the droplets from touching their exoskeleton and make it easier to get rid of droplets. To make use of surface tension, evolution cracked nanotechnology billions of years before us. Some insects have evolved a surface covered by a short and extremely dense coat of water-repelling hair. Some have more than a million hairs per square millimeter. When the insect dives underwater, air stays inside their fur and forms a coat of air. Water can't enter because the hairs are too tiny to break its surface tension. But it gets even better. As the oxygen of the air bubble runs out, new oxygen diffuses into the bubble from the water around it, while the carbon dioxide diffuses outwards into the water. And so the insect carries its own outside lung around and can basically breathe underwater thanks to surface tension. Ah. This is the same principle that enables pond skaters to walk on water, by the way. Tiny anti-water hairs. The smaller you get, the weirder the environment becomes. At some point, even air becomes more and more solid. Let's now zoom down to the smallest insects known, about half the size of a grain of salt, only 0.15 millimeters long, the fairy fly. They live in a world even weirder than other insects. For them, air itself is like thin jello, a syrup-like mass surrounding them at all times. Movement through it is not easy. Flying on this level is not like elegant gliding. They have to kind of grab and hold on to air. So their wings look like big hairy arms rather than proper insect wings. They literally swim through the air like a tiny gross alien through syrup. God damn. So there's an insect 
to whom air is literally like you know water they have to swim through it that is ridiculous yeah i mean the the smaller and smaller uh, the life gets it becomes weirder and weirder i mean we can already see that you know how you know the laws of physics uh, you know basically laws of physics is a bit different for people and things they are smaller and even bigger so the the more smaller and smaller you get you have to think about different things like that like gravity doesn't affect your surface tension is an issue you know uh, basically thickness of the air is the issue uh, i'm pretty sure you know like, that is uh, you know we haven't found anything at the quantum level but it would be ridiculous to see if we can find a life that is that small of a scale i mean you know because we already know at the quantum level that the smallest level there can be you know the phys- uh, laws of physics just change completely at the point that we can't even figure it out Uh, you know quantum physics when we basically okay, you know understand everything about quantum physics that will be the day where you know we dominate science because that will answer a lot of things so yeah it is weird to see things only become stranger from here on as we explore more universes of different sizes the physical there was an instant where we found uh, some kind of a you know living organism from the rock that came from mars and somebody saw the you know basically an organism that was i guess four times as smaller than the smallest organism that is on the planet and you know the somebody some biologists basically said that that can't possibly be life because he was just constrained by the what's possible from whatever sample we have from the this planet so basically it was four times as smaller than smallest life on this planet so he's like that can be uh, that can be a life that that also caused issue like people like why are you using earth as a you know measuring stick this is from this is the rock from the mars so yeah in other planets there must be life that is even smaller than we have or even bigger than we have studying that would you know really change lots of you know field of science too this is just awesome you know quantum physics will basically tells us lots of things about what's possible of life too and same thing vice versa the uh, biggest uh, creature we could find will tell us how they basically live and behave in their environment the smallest creature we will find that will tell us how they live and behave in their environment that will help the you know laws of physics and uh, coming up with uh, more discovery on that area too so physics and biology basically will help each other out in the future the rules are so different for each size that evolution had to engineer around them over and over as life grew in size in the last billion years So why are there no ants the size of horses? Why no elephants the size of There are no ants uh, the size of horses because they would collapse under their own weight because they would be so heavy and their uh, slim legs cannot take it I guess. That's why elephants have stumpy legs, big and thick. Amoeba. Why? We'll discuss this in the next part. Yeah. Yeah, I guess he's going to talk about that. Why if if there is if there is a, a real Godzilla he can't come out of the water because he would collapse if as soon as he comes up from the water just by its own weight the leg has to be immensely thick so yeah this was a great video i can't wait to react next life and size part 2 i guess all right people if you like my reaction don't forget to like and subscribe check out the reaction day there's a link in the description check out the cast world please check out the end cards and i'll see you next time